of the Apple case is that it's a biosecurity matter, mm -hmm. but we all know, of course, that it's a blatant protectionism. Mm -hmm. Right, well, we'll wait and see what mm -hmm. happens there. Now, uh, Lord Nicholas Stern, a British economist, he was uh, speaking in Auckland, uh, and he said in the uh, New Zealand Herald, our exports could be shut out of markets if we don't reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, is the situation really as serious as that, Brian, or is he... No, overstating I, things. No, I don't think so. You mm. know, you get people coming down or so-called experts and they make these comments they're picked up by the newspapers. No, I, I doubt it. Look, the consumer in the end, when you talk to New Zealand wine exporters and you talk to them about selling to the supermarkets in the UK, they all talk about pricing and they all talk about marketing and the positions that they're in. I have real doubts if, if you know, our carbon footprint and that is going to have a, a significant impact upon whether we sell or not in the UK. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I went to a luncheon where he spoke to business people. This was not a particular issue. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's a, quite a pragmatic guy, actually. I was surprised. And he isn't very dogmatic on issues like this. In fact, mm -hmm. he almost says that uh, consumers are going to do what they're going to do and they don't actually want to pay more for organic mm -hmm. uh, produce and that sort of thing if price is the, is the, uh, the key issue. So uh, I don't think... It's overstating a little bit to say that that's the summary of his point of view. Right, OK. Well, uh, as we saw on Country 99 TV News, um, Fonterra's opened its new Crawford Street uh, hub down in Hamilton. Uh, it's boosted UHT milk production. All seems to be go. Uh, but yet there's a, a story in the uh, Herald saying the tech sector is tipped to top dairy despite dip. What do you think, Neville? Well, that's an interesting survey because uh, finding 100 companies in New Zealand is, is a big ask. And mm. uh, there's no doubt that a lot of the technology companies, by whatever definition, and that's a fairly broad definition, uh, we've got a lot of activity going in there, everything from Fisher & Paykel Healthcare through to software companies and uh, really high-tech companies like Racon. And there's a lot of them, mm. and a lot of them are getting up to that uh, magic 100 million and plus figure. But... Uh, you know, $15 billion worth is a long way to go yet, and yeah. they're nowhere near that yet. I, I totally disagree with that comment because mm. I did some work on exports last week to work out whether we were becoming less dependent upon dairy and agricultural exports. We're becoming even more dependent. Mm. I mean, the dairy industry is going ahead in leaps and bounds compared to tech. There are a few good companies, I don't deny that, but I would be highly sceptical about the ability of the tech industry to ever get near dairy in my lifetime. Well, so, we've heard these sort of claims before haven't we, uh, over a number of years, that uh, these are going to be the, the up-and-coming industries that New Zealand really needs to focus on, and yet, as you say, Brian, agriculture keeps coming back again and again. Well, these kind of companies need a lot of capital. They need mm -hmm. a lot of savings to be made, and they need a lot of capital to be invested. They don't have the capital. There are people with very good ideas. There are people that probably could turn small companies into large companies, mm -hmm. but they don't have the capital. Whereas the dairy industry does have the capital. There's a huge amount of capital in dairy although Fonterra wants more, there still is a substantial capital and that allows companies and industries to grow. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that these are very mobile companies. They can be taken over exactly. uh, mm -hmm. by overseas yeah. companies. The technology can be moved offshore. Mm -hmm. The thing about daring you is you can't. No. And the thing about that uh, hub in Hamilton, that's huge capital expenditure. Uh, Fonterra spending up money in Auckland and the UHT plant and also in Tasmania. So it's, uh, it's spending a lot more money than uh, some of these companies are worth. Right, OK. Well, related to the uh, dairy industry, uh, May Wang is behind the establishment of a new milk processing plant in Tauranga, uh, according to the Farmers Weekly. Um, and national, uh, Natural Dairies has been quick to uh, distance itself. But uh, May Wang and that company are linked in the public's mind. I don't, think, I, I don't think we should even be talking about May Wang. I don't know why we talk with her. She's a failed business person. Mm. She owes substantial money to finance companies. She's left them completely in the lurch. Mm -hmm. I don't know why she generates the kind of publicity. Mm -hmm. She just seems to be a maverick out there coming up with all these crazy ideas where she's going to get the money from them all, yet the media gives her huge publicity. I don't mm. understand it, to be honest with you. Mm. Right. An interesting uh, little side thing to this <laughs> is that United Press, which is part of this as well, quite a powerful media group in Hong Kong have launched a newspaper in Auckland, quite a big uh, broadsheet paper full of what you might call propaganda for, oh. for the dairy industry and that sort of thing. And this week's issue, they've got a, a Hong Kong film star 
tr drinking New Zealand milk in oh. a New Zealand paddock. So I don't know what's behind it <laughs> oh, all, but uh, certainly they are uh, pushing <laughs> a particular very, very line Very interesting, there. yeah. Mm. Well, don't show a copy of that to uh, Morris Williamson, because uh, he's in hot water um, for what some have interpreted as being uh, racist comments about foreign ownership of New Zealand land. Do you think he was being racist, Neville, or he was just expressing oh. views a lot of New Zealanders would share? Yeah, I think so, and he isn't the first to be uh, trapped into saying something he probably... In the context of a lot of these audiences people are talking to, you can be quite loose, but it, once it gets into the media, it becomes a, an event in itself, and that's certainly not just uh, restricted to New Zealand. Yeah. But this issue isn't going away, is it, Brian, uh, foreign land ownership? Uh... It's an important issue. It's an mm. issue that needs to be discussed on a rational basis, on mm -hmm. a purely rational basis. If somebody can come in and buy land and they can add substantial value that New Zealanders can't do, there's some justification. If they come in and they strip it and if they utilise it for themselves well, well, that's another argument. Mm -hmm. We really have to debate it from a rational point of view rather than bring in the emotional type issue. It is important, though. Mm -hmm. Most countries do debate these issues. Right. Well, moving on to the uh, wool industry. Uh, prices were up quite strongly at the uh, Napier sale last week. Uh, could this be the turnaround that's been talked about for a long time for the industry, Neville? When you go out into the country and you talk to some farmers and they're shearing sheep, they tell you, look, I'm getting nothing for it, but I just have to shear them. Well, hopefully it will be a turning point. But look, anybody who is predicting it at this stage would be rather foolish, given what has happened to the wool industry over the last 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. Right. But the demand mm -hmm. is still there from China, isn't it? Uh, and it's a, a fabulous natural product. Yeah, I think a, a lot more work needs to be done there. But what about these men who are getting involved in knitting circles? That was oh, on television you, this week. Yeah, you well, see, you so, think that might be the so, answer. So home craft might be the way to go, even if the have Chinese all got into home craft. <laughs> we'll, we'll look. Maybe we could get all the Chinese men to knit. You see. That would be, be the answer, wouldn't be it? Be and maybe you can lead the campaign in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than buy a sock. <laughs> Coming up, you beauty, where we dish out the praise or a bollocking, the opposite. Find out who gets what. That's coming up right after the break. Welcome back to Straight Talk. Now it's on to you beauty, praise or a bollocking, the opposite. What do you have, Neville? I've been involved in the judging of the regional business awards in Auckland and it's interesting to see that food companies have done very well. Mm -hmm. And in, Man in Manukau, we've, we'll be announcing them on Friday night, there's a food company involved there. But North Shore that was won by Ezio, a company that started in, literally in, a, in some people's kitchen in Auckland but now is owned by Westland Milk, mm -hmm. huge big plant at Albany selling their uh, yoghurt powder to about 30 or 40 countries around the world, hugely successful and a well-deserved award. That's been a great investment for uh, Westland, hasn't it? Which uh, perhaps people were a little uh, uh, querulous about at the time. Uh, as well, to yes, exactly it took a long time doing. for the couple who started it to get it off the ground, but obviously coming in with a, a supply of milk like that and quite a bit of capital. I mean, Westland's not a big company no. by any standard compared with Fonterra, but this is a niche product that's gone hugely well in Asia mm -hmm. and it's uh, sold in those same packs all around the world. Mm. So, uh, Brian, do you think uh, companies with products like this, this is the future for um, the export level of New Zealand agriculture, smaller niche levels of things rather than the large-scale commodity sales? Exactly, and this is why I argue that it's going to be so difficult for the tech industry to bypass this because this is the kind of thing that we're naturally good at. We have more capital to invest in it and we do have a competitive advantage. So, yes, it's great to hear stories like that. Mm. But this has taken a long time to uh, develop that small company, hasn't it, Neville? And uh, it's uh, ridden the, uh, the rises and falls uh, when uh, yoghurt was, uh, making yoghurt at home was pretty much out of favour at one stage, wasn't it? That's right, and it's mm. sort of come into fashion again, but it's ba basically sold in Asia as a health food now because you can put various nutrients in it and that sort of thing, so it's become what they call a, a functional food. Mm. Well, we uh, wish all the best to uh, the finalists uh, in, in those awards. I'm sure there's some uh, more examples like that coming up.
Yeah. Now, Brian, I believe you've got a uh, bollocking for us this week. Yes, it's really to the directors of NZ Farming Systems Uruguay, which is subject to a takeover offer from Olam. And, and the reason that I, I'm critical of them is normally directors give a very firm recommendation and give a very firm view in, in terms of their own shares, what they're going to do with their own shares. But what they've said here is, they've said, well, each director is facing a different situation. Some may sell, some may sell some of their shares, and some may not sell any of their shares. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very vague. I think it's the duty of directors to make it quite clear, not only what shareholders should do, but what they are doing with their own shares. And in this circumstances, they aren't. And it's uh, a lot of shareholders have, have contacted me, have either emailed or rang me up saying, what are these directors up to? Why can't they tell us exactly what they're going to do with their own shares? So they should be putting more pressure on those directors uh, now to do exactly that, should they? Yeah, well, there's no certainty ever in a takeover offer because this company is probably going to end up still being listed on the stock exchange with all them probably owning 60 or 70 percent but it would have been nice if the directors were just a little bit more clear about what they intended to do with their own shares. Brian were they ambivalent because of that 50 percent offer? Oh well they are. Confused yeah. things, well it has I mean it does confuse them and I agree mm. that they, well no it was a full offer it's, mm. but it's conditional only getting to 50 percent yeah. they're after 100 percent but it mm. doesn't look like they will get 100 percent but the directors have just left it a little bit too open I think in this one and I would have liked to have seen a more I'd like to each director to have stayed I intend to sell all or some of my shares rather than a very vague comment. Each director is in different circumstances and may sell all, some or none of their shares. Mm. If, if Olam gets control though, how many of them will uh, survive? <laughs> well, uh, well, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, well, yeah. What difference did it make that the uh, Uruguay player that was interested uh, supposedly in a uh, uh, partial takeover came in and then moved out so rapidly? Well, because the Olam came in with a higher price and, and also the directors did have another party that they were talking about who would come in and put money into the company. Mm -hmm. But once Olam increased, the original bid was 55 cents. Once they came in with the 70 cents, the ACC decided to accept. And then I think the directors realised that another offer would not be attractive to shareholders. This was the one that the ACC, this is the one that PGW Wrightson wanted. Mm -hmm. So um, they are going to get the 50. There are 42% at the moment. They will get the 50%, but it's doubtful whether they get to the 90%, which leads to compulsory acquisition. Right. Oh, well, we'll wait and see uh, what uh, shareholders decide there. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thanks to my guest, National Business Review editor Neville Gibson, that's and right. Milford Asset Management's Brian Gaynor. And thanks to you for watching. You can always email me at country99tv.co.nz and remember to check out my blog. We'll see you next time.